MS stats and see what is MS stats doing and, and how it works. And this presentation, so or this session, I, I will be presenting it, but we prepare it together with Mina Choi, who is the one of the main developers of, of MS stats. So MS stats was published some couple of years ago in bioinformatics, but this is an open source R package containing several functions that allow us to analyze MS acquired data sets <laughs> and, <coughs> and it has been mainly developed in the group of Professor Olga Vitek, first in Purdue University and now in Northeastern University. But what does MS stats do or what w can we do with this R package? So we can do different things. First one is to test proteins for differential abundance. Second thing is that we can also quantify or get an estimate of protein abundance in a single sample. And the third one is that we can actually use our data as a pilot experiment to predict and design future experiments. MSTATS can deal with different type of data sets, label free or with internal standards, and also with different type of acquisition methods, either SRM, shotgun, or data independent acquisition methods. And finally, we can compare different groups like case control or time series, or also paired experiments so that we take an individual before and after a treatment, or, an, or we follow this same individual after several time points. Right, and all these type of experimental designs, we can analyze them using MSTATS. So MSTATS, you can get, you can get it from Bioconductor, from MSTATS.org, or as you will see in the tutorial after this talk, so for directly from Skyline. Currently, the latest version is, as Olga introduced, is version number three, and this is. This is available in the msstats.org and also in the Skyline, but not in Bioconductor because the upgrades or updates in Bioconductor follow a different timeline and the, this version will only be incorporated in, in, well, in the next few months. So first, to know how msstats works, let's focus on the input format. And these are the type of data that you need to to provide MSTAT with to make it work. So in this input format, what you need, first of all, is a protein, protein name column, a peptide, the peptide, also the precursor charge, the fragment, the fragment charge, and then you need to specify whether it's labeled in a heavy form or in a light form. In some type of experimental designs, you will not get fragment or product charges, for example, in MS1 quantitation shotgun experiments. Then here you can put just zero or NA for the information corresponding to the fragment and the fragment charge. Once you specify this, there is also the condition which um, you can specify which are your controls, which are your wild types and, and treated samples. Then the biological replicates, the run, and finally, the intensity under the or the area under the curve of the quantified feature. With this data, then we start with MSTATS. And in the general workflow that Professor Olga Vitek already uh, introduced, the first step is to do the quality control and the normalization steps. And there are two functions in the R package that do this this work, which are the data process and the data process plots. And with these two functions, what you can do is you can, norm well, first of all, do data transformation to log scale, then do the normalization, also deal with missing values. Some of you were asking before how we can deal with missing values with MSTAT, so we will check, check it here. Then as a fourth step, you can also do feature selection and assess feature variability. And finally, you can visualize all this data. So let's see the first part, which is data transformation. So <coughs> the first thing you need to do is to convert these areas or intensities uh, um, to the log, the log scale, right? No matter whether it's log 2 or log 10, but in this way, you will have normal distributed data. And this is one of the main assumptions of the statistical model underlying an, in MSTATS. 
then you can do normalization and within MSTAT you can decide not to do any normalization, do constant normalization where we norm where we equalize all the medians of all the runs, do quantile normalization or use certain standards that you know you spike in or 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 they are housekeeping proteins and you can specify them in the in the script so that all samples are normalized based on these proteins. You can or we can visualize this in here, right? So this is the type of of plots that we could we could use to visualize normalization. So here are all the runs and this is divided between the st internal standards that we in this case we assume that we spike them in constant in a constant rate or constant concentration and the same for the endogenous for the endogenous peptides or proteins. And then here I plot the log to intensity and as you can see, so one of the assumptions that would be, well, I spike a constant internal standard, so it should be equal in all the samples is not true, right? And given this assumption, what I can do is to actually normalize based on equal equalization of medians as I'm doing here, or another way to do it is quantile normalization, which what we do is to actually make the distributions, so equalize distributions, so that the distribution of the first um, run is exactly the same as the second run. And this is why this plot looks so nice. But actually you are also, or you're, you have the risk to do an over normalization, right? So you are fitting so well the data that actually you are introducing bias. So what, which, so whether to use one type of normalization or another depends a lot on your assumption, right? Here we assume that we have a constant re heavy reference standard that is equal to all the samples and how your data looks like. Why is it important to take into account your assumption? So any normalizations assume something, right? In, the, in these cases, we assume constant, 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 concentrations of the internal standard. But in some experiments, like for example, label-free SRM data, in which you have selected, let's say, a subset of 10 proteins that you know they are very interesting because they are changing, <coughs> actually, this is the data you, you have, right? If I would normalize this, what I would get is, of course, a normalized data set. But I know that this, this is not true because my assumption of constant constant concentration was was not true from the very beginning. This means that, so this is biological difference, true difference, right? And we don't want to normalize this data. So it's very important that in before doing a normalization, know what should remain constant in your data set and then choose your normalization step accordingly. And this step of normalization as you will see in the tutorial. So it's very well implemented, not only in R, but also in the Skyline with a gra nice graphical user interface. So also, so continuing with these two functions, data process and data process plots, the third part that we can do is actually dealing with missing values. And in this third, in this third version of MSTATS, we can decide whether we treat missing values as censored, so assuming that I, they are below a limit of detection, or they are missing at random. So this means that uh, it's not, so we don't see the peptide, not because it's not there, but because technical variability, right? And based on this, we can, for example, if we say it's censored, so that we couldn't detect this peptide because of the limit of detection, then we can impute its minimal value based on minimal in, in the run, the minimal for that particular feature or peptide, or minimal per protein, right? And so these are options that are available in MSTATS and you can actually choose which one for, to, to implement or to, to use in, in each of your analysis. The fourth step is the feature selection. And so, these functions of data process and data process plots also contain parameters that allow you to either use all features or only use the most informative features. 
this was not a problem when MS stat, stat, stats started because it was mainly devoted for SRM analysis. But once we started using data independent analysis where you can use or extract um, peptide information or for a given protein you can extract all the peptide information, then the question arises of how many peptides should I use to, to quantify this protein. Because the more peptides, the more noisy your measurements are. So MSTATS implements ways that you, one can account for feature variability so that one can wait for the, for the features that are less variable than others. Right? And then, so related to this, we can actually also tell MSTATS whether to assume or not equal variance among, in, among different features depending on their intensity. And finally, with the data visualization plots for the quality control and normalization, we can do three types of plots. And we will generate them also in this tutorial, which are the profile plot, where we see for each specific run, the intensity, the log intensity of each transition of each peptide corresponding to this protein. So here, for example, there are three lines for red lines for one peptide, three other ones which are green for the second peptide of this protein, and three other lines in in black which are which are corresponding to the third protein. And here, what we can see is analyzing these plots is what 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 a point here is to show or to realize whether or where our variation comes from, whether it comes from the run. So is there a run to run variability like in this case where it's, it has a lot of variability between runs or between conditions, right? For example, in this case, healthy and disease states. We can also use this type of plots not only to detect run or transition problems, but also to show that missingness, right? So missing points, like in this case. So if you look at this at this transition here, you can see that for most of the runs, or for at least half of them, we it's well we have a lot of missing points. And also this well this transition compared to the other ones is the 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 low the low the one with low lower intensity. Then we have the QC plots that we have already seen, where we can see the, the average lock, lock intensities for each run, both in the reference and in the, in the endogenous samples. And finally, we have also the condition plot, in which we see the, the lock to ratio between the heavy and the light intensities for given features, with the error bar indicating the interval at 95% at significance level, right? And here, for example, we can see, so this is one condition and this is another condition and we can see already, uh, uh, well, uh, consistent difference in, in, in log ratios. So once we have done the quality control and normalization, the second step in MSTATS is to do the group comparisons. And for this, the R package inc incorporates two functions, which are the group comparison, and similarly to the first one, we have also the group comparison plots function. And here we can, or the steps are first to fit the statistical model, second to verify the, the model assumptions, then to do the comparison itself, and finally visualize the results. So the first step is, as Olga already showed before, is to fit the statistical model. And MSTATS version 3, what it's doing, it's doing this in two steps. In the first step, it, it models the, peak inten the observed peak intensity and takes into account the run and the feature variability and its interaction. And in this way, we can have an estimate of protein abundance per run. Then, one, once we have this, then we can actually do the second part. So now we already have an estimate of protein abundance per run. So let's do prot uh, comparison, the comparison between different conditions. And here, we take into account the conditions and the var variance in the biological replicates as well as random mass er 
measurement error. Once the, we fit the statistical model, the second part is to verify the model assumption. And this is actually a very important part, right? Um, MSTATS implements a linear mixed model, and this is a parametric model that have some assumptions. So there are some assumptions that we take from granted for, for our mass spectrometry data. All, this is something that actually we as a users, we don't need to verify. This was verified from, in the, for example, in the publication and for SRM data, shotgun data, and lately also for data independent data. So whenever you have this type of data, you can use MSTATS without any problem. Don't use, so there will be a point when we, you will feel very comfortable with MSTATS and you will say, well, I can, I can assess different protein abundances and, and in different conditions. And maybe then you say, well, now I have my microarray data set. And then the structure, the input file, you could actually arrange it in a similar way, but then no one would have verified the model assumptions. So it's very dangerous to use this type of models in data in which you have not verified the assumptions that you are taking from granted in the statistical model. Again, so the model so the model based group comparison is well implemented in 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 the Skyland and our our condition or our well our hypothesis here is is the is there a difference in abundance of protein, let's say, A, between condition 1 and 2, right? And what, what MSTATS gives us is a p-value indicating, as Olga introduced before, the probability of getting um, a statistic that is below or, or a certain threshold, given that the null hypothesis is true, right? What it does not say is whether you're, you're well, or the reason why a protein is significant, right? And this is a very important distinction and has, has been a lot of debate in, in the journals about how we use p-values. So one thing is to say, well, my, my p-value is significant, so I cannot take my null hypothesis uh, as true, and therefore I take the alternative approach. Hypothesis, but how plausible is your alternative hypothesis? This does not depend on the p-value, right? For example, I can use uh, so we can do a phosphorylation experiment with some inhibitor, and then we can we can say, well, well, we can test for for different abundant phosphorylations and and detect some some significant changes. Right? So what we are testing with this p-value is just that there is a significant change. Whether this was related to your inhibitor or to someone that actually, uh, well, or any other reason, so this is something that actually you have to, to, to evaluate with other or with many other support, experimental support. Right? So the outcome that you will get from MSTATS and that in a Skyline is saved in, in a file called testingresults.csv. It's this type of, of spreadsheet where you have, again, your protein that you define in your input, the labels, so the comparison, in this case it's disease versus healthy, a log fold change estimate, the standard error of this log fold change, the statistical value, the degrees of freedom, which, and these both are used to actually calculate the p-value. Once you get the p-value, MSTATS also corrects for multiple testing, and then what we should see is the adjusted, or what we should check for, for uh, the column that we should check is the adjusted p-value. Again, so in this block, we can also do several plots. The first one is the Volcano plot, in which we represent the log log 10 or log 2 full change, again, doesn't matter much whether we use the 2 or 10, and the minus log 10 of the adjusted p-value, right? So in this sense, the farther down or the farther up, the bigger the full change, and the farther up, the bigger the significance of this change, right? And here, so MSTATS can label it, can can label each of the dots, can label only the significant ones, and can also color the, the, the dots depending on whether the changes are 
going up or down. One important thing of the Vulcano plots is that every or every Vulcano plot reflects only one comparison. In this case, disease and healthy. If we want to have an overview of all the disease or all the states or conditions that we have in our in our experiment, then MSTATs allow us to do a heat map plot. So this is wrong. So it's not a Vulcano plot; it's a heat map plot. Plot. And here, for example, we have a time course all referred to time one, which is the first condition, and we can compare how different proteins, which are the different rows, evolve or their abundance goes up or down. Um, in time, for example, in this case, time three, time five, time seven, compared to the starting point. The colors do not represent fold changes, but p-values. Well, the intensity of the color, right? And this is because the p-value already concentrates both the significance and the magnitude of the fold change. So the biggest the fold change, the, the smaller the p-value will be, right? And the colors, so this is divided by uh, negative fold changes in blue and positive fold changes in red. And finally, we have the comparison plot in which we represent log fold changes. And this is slightly different from the other plot that we saw before, which we were representing the log two ratios heavy light. Okay, so this is the result already of the of the comparison. So you have each comparison in here. And then, so the, the estimated log full change plus minus the the 95 confidence interval. And finally, as the third block of MSTATS, is the experimental design of follow-up studies that Olga already presented in, in her lecture. And for this, we have two, again, two types of functions, the design sample size and the design sample size plots that allow us to calculate how how big or how many replicates we have to need, we need for future experiments for each of the different type of, of acquisition methods, depending on the fold change that we want to be able to, to determine as a significant fold change. And also, as we discussed in the, in the previous lecture, so what, what is here, what we can see is that, for example, here we have decided fold change to be detected as significant and the number of biological replicates. So this means that if I want to be able to detect something that is significantly changing and has a full change of 1.5, at least I would need, let's say, two replicates. But if I want to be more sensitive and be able to, to detect those proteins that change in 20%, so that have a full change of 1.2, I would need at least eight replicates. If I don't have eight replicates, I will never be able to detect a significant protein that, that is changing only 20% of their abundance. Right? And this you cannot, you cannot predict beforehand. You have to do a pilot experiment. And once you have this pilot experiment, you can assess the variability of your runs or your technical replicates or biological replicates. And with this, variability assessment, you can do this type of experimental design plots. So, MSTATS is integrated in, in the Skyline, and this is what, what we will do in the tutorial. So, in, in the tutorial, you, you will have to actually go to the, to the tool, tool store of Skyline, install it from there, and once, once you, you have it installed, but I guess that most of you already, already installed it, so there is a, a new menu in the tools that that represents MSTATS, and here you can do actually either one of the three steps that that we have reviewed at the moment. So for each of these steps, we have actually a nice um, graphical user interface. For example, here the QC or the group comparison, and okay, it's back. And not only this, but actually MSTATS also locks everything that we are doing in, in a Skyline with, with the ER package, right? So here, if there is any, any kind of error, or, uh, or you, so it will, be, it will pop up here, that it's also, it's a window that, especially in, Sky, especially in Skyline, and also here you can see how, the, so the progress of, of MSTATS. So MSTATS needs uh, a few minutes to actually 
do the protein comparison and you can see here so that it has done for example the first out first protein out of 48 and so on and so forth okay so another thing to, that i would like to highlight is that msstats and the skyline provides complementary quality control plots right so these are the type of plots that are, you are used in the skyline for example the retention time deviation or for example the relative intensity of of each of the of the transitions that you detect in each run. In contrast, here in, in MSTATS, so these are plots that are generated within Skyline with MSTATS. What you see is one of the profile plots, right? So that the reference is constantly uh, abandoned in all the in all the runs. Whereas, for example, here pro probably this corresponds to two different conditions: one here, one there, and you can see that actually all peptides for this given protein are behaving in the same way. So also analyzing this type of plots, we can detect right, poor quality peaks. Right? For example, here you see that two, pep two peptides, especially the, the green one and, the, and some transitions of the, of the black one, actually have a lot of run-to-run -run variation. Right? And this actually, looking at this plot, then we can go back to the chromatography plot or, or the retention time or the peak area percentage plot of the skyline and detect that actually here we missed the real, the real peak, which is this one, and actually automatically integrated the wrong peak. Oops. Here. So it has a problem of constant. Okay, well, so you cannot read it here. Well, anyway, so these, are not, I would like also to highlight some other examples from a, a, a data set, which is rat plasma for, for heart disease, where the up to seven different biological replicates were treated with high, high salt or low salt, and each of these biological animal or uh, replicates were, was was injected three times. So here we have a data set with three technical replicates, eight biological con um, replicates, and two different conditions. Right? And then we see things, so within this data set, we look at, at the plots that are generated by both Skyline and MS stats, and we, thinks, we, th we see things like this, right? So this is a protein with two different peptides measured, one is very constant and the other has a lot of interrun variability. Right? And we, we check the first one, which is the red one, and we see that actually all the peak areas percentage or the relative per um, percentage of areas for each transition looks very good. Actually, the peak is defined and the retention time is quite consistent. Whereas, for example, if we look at the other one, then we start understanding why we see this pattern here. Right, so this is one of the peak uh, that was integrated in this type of samples here, and and this is the the difference in in relative abundance of each of the transition. You can see that actually this is not always uh, so bad. So here it's very variable, whereas here it's not, and also in terms of intensity. And this is a case where a peptide is present in one condition and completely absent in the other one. And these are things that we can either see in these type of plots, like this one is very, very nice, or also looking at the interrun variability of the profile plot generated by Skyline. One important thing is that whether we consider or we don't consider this peptide, it will change our results, right? So for example, here we had a peptide that it was quite constant in both, in both states, whereas another one that was absent in one of them and present in the other. So if we check for all features, we have an adjusted p-value of, well, or a significant p-value, whereas if we, we take only the red one and let's say a threshold of 0 0.01, so this would not be significant. And if we take only the, the black one, we will, we, well, we get also significant change, right? Another case are things like this, right? So this is not a constant peptide again or in contrast to a 
present absent peptide, but actually several peptides of a given protein that are constant, and one of them that is weird, at least, right? So it's present in all samples, as we can see, right? So this one of them, it's good, both at the relative intensities, uh, intensities, big shape, retention time, and here is one of the other ones, right? So also, again, good good retention time, good intensities, good peak shape, good relative intensi um, intensities of each of the transition, and there is no uh, clear explanation why is this happening, right? So here again, so if we take all features, we have certain log two, log two fold change estimate of two. For example, if we only took, take two of them, we have another log fold fall change estimate, which is very different from the previous one, and if we only take the, the black one, so again, so we have a different log fall change estimate. And these are things that you can see with this type of plots and this type of analysis, and that actually by looking just at the, at the plots in a skyline, w you would not notice, right, because these plots actually look very nice. So why are these or why are these things happening? Well, it's it's complicated to say, and whether we we should believe the the green, well, the green and the red, or whether this. Um, so there is no solution to this, right? Because both pep or all peptides are are equally good. It could happen that this this peptide here, for example, gets phosphorylated, so or part of the population of this peptide is modified. So we see uh, an as it was being reduced, but actually what it happens is that part of the population of this peptide is being modified, not reduced, or it can happen that there is also, I don't know, point mutation in this, in one of the conditions that we are analyzing, so on and so forth. But this is case by case um, explanation that you in your data set should actually uh, study. Right? So the important thing is that with MSTATs you can actually identify these cases and then if you know your system, actually you can do or you can make decisions on whether to keep or to kick them out or do whatever, right? In this case, for example, that is, so for this particular protein, you have several peptides that are not changing and only one that is behaving weird. So probably the, the, pep, the protein is, is actually not changing and this peptide is getting modified, okay? And with this, right, so I would like to to thanks, especially all the all the people that are working hard in the implementation and development of MSTATS in the in the laboratory of Professor Olga Vitek, especially Mina, and also the people at University of Washington and ETH Zurich that had a lot of discussions on specific problems on how to analyze data and triggered many of the implementations and developments in MSTATS. And now, so we, well, I will take questions and we will proceed to the tutorial. Any So when you uh, analyze the data, how do you treat the technical replicates? Do you take an average from them? For example, if you have three technical replicates and then uh, analyze only averages uh, of technical replicates or you put everything together? Because I've seen in the form you put all three values for three technical replicates, but how does the program solve the problem? Okay, so the thing is, uh, so this is the input file and we specify the condition and the biological replicate. Right? So you don't have theoretically a column saying technical replicate, but actually we have the run column, right? And this, so for example, for condition one, I will have, so if you don't fractionate, for sample one, you will have one run. For the biological replicate, you will have a second run and so on. And if, and if you would have replicates, you would have for one biological replicate, run one, run two, run three. And this is information that is kept separately uh, until the protein level, right? So, oops. so there are no, where is it? 
So there is no averaging, but actually the, both the feature and the run, so your technical replicates are taking into account in the first part of the model that estimates the protein abundance in each of your acquisition or, or runs. Okay, good, so then we start with the last tutorial of the course.